Hi, I'm Chris Potts. The goal of this screencast is to review our basic theory of the compositional semantics of adjectives. First, let's review the typology that we developed in class based on the reading by Barbara Partee. We say that an adjective adj is intersective if and only if, when we combine it with a noun n, the resulting meaning is just the intersection of the meaning of adj and the meaning of n. For instance, if we treat the adj Swedish as denoting the set of all Swedes, that is, if we assume it can have an intersective analysis, and if we treat the n student as denoting the set of all students, then their semantic combination is just the intersection, the set of all things that are both Swedish and students. We say that an adjective adj is subsective if and only if combining adj with any noun n returns a set that is a subset of the original noun n. The adjective skillful is a clear example. A skillful spy is certainly a spy. This alone doesn't say which set we end up with. That has to be built into the meaning of each adjective. Rather, it just says that we're constrained to be somewhere inside the original n. It's important to note that by these two definitions, intersective adjectives are just special kinds of subsective adjectives. This is true because of the set theoretic principle that says for any sets a and b, a intersected with b is a subset of a, and a intersected with b is a subset of b. So all intersective adjectives meet the subsective requirement. Here's the beginnings of a typology for these adjective types with intersective as a special case of the larger class of subsective adjectives. An adjective adj is non-subsective if and only if we can find at least one n for which the meaning of adj n is not contained in the meaning of n. A clear example of a non-subsective adjective is alleged. An alleged spy is not necessarily a spy, but it might be. This is likely to be the largest class of adjectives because the definition is so permissive. First of all, all it takes is one single n for which adj n isn't a subset of n semantically. There might be many n's for which adj n is inside n. We just find one that isn't, and the adj is classified as non-subsective. In addition, the core requirement itself is really weak. It just says that we can find at least one entity that is in adj n, but not in n. There might be many that are. In other words, we might fail the subsective requirement by the smallest margin, and that's enough for non-subsective. Here's how we expand the typology of adjectives with the non-subsective ones. Finally, the privative adjectives are a special case of the non-subsective ones, so we find them inside the space of non-subsective adjectives. Here the condition is that adj n is outside the set n. Adjectives like former seem to be privative, but probably the clearest case is the prefix non, as in non-student. It's not an adjective syntactically, but it's the best example for getting at the privative intuition. The students and the non-students seem clearly to be disjoint. By the typology, every privative adjective is non-subsective. Privative is the special case where there is no overlap between the two sets. So privativity is a special and especially strong kind of non-subsectivity. Our next step is to begin to develop an account of how these adjectives work compositionally, that is, how they combine with nouns to create new meanings. We have two rules for this. The first handles only intersective adjectives. It basically just repeats the definition of intersectivity by saying that the meaning of the modified noun is the intersection of the meaning of n with the meaning of adj. Things are less transparent for all the other cases. For them, we have a separate composition rule that says the meaning of adj n is the functional meaning of the adjective applied to the noun. That's what this notation here means. It presumes that adj is not a set, but rather a function, and it applies that function to the n to return a new set of entities. Which set? That's determined not by the rule, but rather by the functional meaning of the adjective itself as given in the lexicon. To make this a bit more concrete, let's look at some schematic functional meanings for non-intersective adjectives. Uh, here's one. On the left, we have sets of entities. These are the inputs to the function. Uh, the arrow shows what happens when each input is received. It is mapped to a new set, the meaning of the modified n. So the adjective's meaning isn't any particular set. Uh, it's the way it would be for an intersective adjective. Rather, it's this big abstract machine of sorts. The meaning given here satisfies the definition of being subsective. For each input on the left, the corresponding output set is a subset of that input. Hence, we'd place this in the set of subsective adjectives. Here's a non-subsective adjective. 
The modified set is sometimes a subset of the input, as in the bottom line, but it often isn't, hence this weak designation. Finally, here's a privative adjective. Uh, the output is always disjoint from the input. So those are the mechanics. Intersective, that's easy. All the others seem complex. It's worth then addressing the question of why we can't treat every adjective as intersective. Why not just say all adjectives denote sets? I think the clearest argument is one where we try to assume that they all can be treated as sets and show that this leads to a contradiction. Now assume that Bart Simpson is a skillful skateboarder, and assume also that he is a student, though not a skillful student. Now if skillful denotes a set, then it's clear that this amounts to saying that Bart is in the intersection of the skillful things and the skateboarders. Thus, of course, he has to be in the set skillful. It thus follows from our assumption that he's a student, that he's also a skillful student. But this contradicts our previous assumption. Where did we go wrong? It was in assuming that we could define a set of skillful things independently of the end being modified. Being skillful at one thing doesn't make you skillful at all things. But the intersective analysis would force us to just such an absurd position. The functional meaning for skillful avoids this because it lets us say for each input n what the resulting output set is. Let's close by seeing how all these pieces fit together. Here's a basic syntactic structure for the phrase alleged female Swedish spy. This has three adjectives stacked up. Interpreting it is no problem given the assumptions we've made. If we start with the meaning of spy as the set here, and we modify it with the intersective adjective Swedish, then the meaning of that first note is just the set of things that are both Swedish and spies. Next, we can treat female as intersective as well. Thus, we can use the intersective rule again. The meaning of female is intersected with the meaning we just calculated. And the result is the set of entities that are female and Swedish and spies. Finally, alleged isn't intersective, but rather non-subsective. It's looking for sets as inputs. Luckily, it's got one to its right. So it takes that set as input. Uh, and the result is another set, the output. We'll stop here, but we could continue indefinitely stacking adjectives. That's the beauty of semantic composition. From basic assumptions, we can often interpret an endless number of structures.